You're listening to the Turn Autism Around podcast, episode number 95. I'm your host, Dr. Mary Barbera, and today I have a very special guest, Dr. Keith Williams um, from the Hershey Medical Center Feeding Center. He's been there for 23 years. He is a top international expert on feeding disorders. We are talking today about picky eating. Um, we're talking about nutritional deficiencies, how to get medication and supplements into your child. Um, what are some of the top tips to uh, help you be more successful with teaching your child to eat better? Um, and which is somewhat related to talking and to behavior reduction. So we are covering all of this. Dr. Williams is a board certified behavior analyst at the doctoral level. He's also a licensed psychologist. So he has a wealth of information. I love the interview. So let's get right to it. Okay, so Dr. Williams, I am so excited for this interview. I actually haven't been this excited for an interview in a long time. So thank you for carving out time to join us. Well, thank you. <laughs> okay, so um, I have been doing uh, several shows in the past uh, sequence of shows. I, I did an interview with uh, Tamara Casper, who's a SLP BCBA. I did a solo show presenting Dr. Ami Klin's information, a solo show incorporating some of Dr. Carbone's information. These were all from the National Autism Conference, which are which is a, a free conference that you can get this information. So I heard you speak um, at the National Autism Conference in 2020, and your talk was was a little different than I've heard in the past. And I have followed your work and met you several times. So um, I was happy to have you on the show. So we are going to link that National Autism Conference uh, talk in the show notes. But um, this is, is, I have uh, tons of questions for you because feeding is just such a huge issue for, it seems like every child on the spectrum. So, before we dive into um, the questions about feeding, I always like to start with describe your fall into the autism world and specifically how you became uh, interested in feeding and became a, an inter international uh, feeding expert. Uh, well, it was actually an accident. Um, I applied for a job at the Kennedy Krieger Institute and I thought I was going to work on the severe behavior unit, but my resume went to the wrong unit and I got offered a job at the feeding program. They were just starting one at the time. And wow. I didn't have a job. I thought I should take it. So it was <laughs> And were you, a, were you a psychologist at that point? or um, I, was a, I was a doctoral student at the University of Maryland. So I was okay. studying to be a psychologist, but was not one yet. So I was the first master's level therapist in the feeding program at Kennedy Krieger. Um, oh, wow. For, from 89 to 97. Um, I did take a two-year hiatus and did work on the neurobehavior unit um, and then went back to feeding as a faculty member and then um, got invited to come to Hershey and I've been here since 97. Wow, that's fascinating. Yeah, sometimes these little accidents, you know, right. you definitely fought, fell into the autism world and the feeding world like by chance. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, it was strictly by chance. It was a... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. Okay, so um, just for the listeners out there, which I think are pretty much half and half parents and professionals, um, Lucas, my son, who's now 24, had very picky eating, especially after he had regression um, at about 15 months, 18 months. He used to eat okay, and then he had regression. Um, and um, at the age of four, four and a half, um, we decided uh, that he would benefit from a feeding clinic. Um, so we went, we, we didn't go to Hershey. We're about an hour from Hershey. We, we went to Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, which were about an hour from there too. And um, they did an outpatient 10 day or two week, like I had to drive him back and forth each day. And it really did turn turn his eating issues around pretty quickly, but it didn't maintain as well as 
what I've seen um, at the Hershey Clinic because the Hershey Clinic is not, well, you have different different levels of, of care, but for kids that are an hour away, you usually, uh, you know, you go for an appointment, six weeks later, you go for an appointment. I think the overall, you know, um, maintaining rate of improvement is probably better with, with a slower approach if it's, if it's not an intensive. Would you agree? Like, well, and our approach, um, I mean, I, I won't speak to theirs, but what we're trying to do is train the caregiver. So we're trying to help the parents or the caregiver um, implement a plan over time. And I think if the family can do that over time, that's going to matter. And that's going to be the thing that helps the child um, learn to eat foods and a wider variety of foods and learn to chew and whatever skill we're working on. So we really do take a parent oriented approach, not a child oriented approach. So in some programs the kid will come in and the focus of treatment is working like a therapist working directly with the child, but they don't spend quite as much time trying to help the parent figure out what can we do when we go home. And that's our whole approach is what is the parent going to do once they get um, in the home setting. Yeah, which is great. So um, you pub you and Dr. Richard Fox published a book called Treating Eating mm-hmm. Problems and uh, for children on the autism spectrum and other developmental delays, uh, disabilities. And that was published in 2007, same year my first book was published. And um, you just told me that you're, you are, uh, doing a revision to this book and hopefully. Yeah, they, um, the publisher contacted us about two or three months ago and asked us to write a revision. So I told him that we would start in the winter. So <laughs> <laughs> we'll, um, we'll revise and update it. Um, I'm hoping over this winter and maybe over the spring. So I talked to yeah. Dr. Fox and he's going to help me and we're going to um, hopefully we'll have a lot. Well, of- in my in my opinion, it doesn't need much because it's a great resource. Um, half of the book is for parents. Half of the book is for professionals. Um, there's there's all kinds of um, kind of data sheets and processes, and I really like that book. Um, but you also have a, a different book called Broccoli Boot Camp, which I didn't know about. So, what is when was Broccoli Boot Camp published, and how is it different than the Treating um, Eating Problem book? Broccoli Boot Camp came out about, uh, it's been just just about two years at this point. And the whole book is focused on helping children that are selective eaters. And in that book, it has a number of different plans. So uh, it's kind of got a wider variety of plans than we talked about in the previous book, which kind of talked about all types of feeding issues. But in Broccoli Boot Camp, we specifically look at selective eating. And we've got a number of different plans that parents can implement. And, um, you know, why does repeated taste exposure work? And why do kids with autism more selective eaters in general? And um, what are the things you have to think about before an intervention? So we went through a number of different things. Um, but it was, it was written specifically for parents. Because we'd been mm. in the clinic, we have all these handouts and stuff that we hand them and plans and stuff. And I was like, we probably should make this a little more formal and turn it into a book. So uh, Laura Syverling worked with me and she had worked with me. I mean, I worked with her for years and we've written a number of papers together. So we wrote this book um, and it got published by Woodbine House last year or two years ago. Okay, Uh, great. Great. Well, we're going to link all of this in the show notes, marybarbera.com forward slash 95. Um, so what percentage of the kids in the Hershey feeding clinic? So you have a clinic, you work there. What what percentage of the kids actually have autism diagnosis? And well, I, I think we get it quite frankly, we get a, there's a referral bias. So there isn't as many programs right around us in like in central PA that work with kids with autism, with feeding issues specifically. So we get a lot of the kids in the area. So we do see probably two to 300 children a year that are on the spectrum. So we see a lot of kids uh, with, that are on the spectrum. And by and large, the the issue that they present with is that they're food selective. Now we do see kids that don't chew, or we may see kids that are on gastrostomy tubes or that are failure to thrive or many things, but the majority of the children we see that are on the autism spectrum are selective eaters. 
Um, and their selectivity yeah. really is from pretty, you know, like they're the, the picky eater that's a really, really picky eater to the point where it's, they've got nutrient deficiency. So it's like beyond the picky eater. Um, yeah, yeah. And I remember, I mean, this is 20 plus years ago, well, well, 20 years ago when we took Lucas to CHOP, like he actually was diagnosed with failure to thrive um, at that point. And I don't know if they did that. I mean, his weight was low, you know, compared to his height. But is, is there like insurance won't cover unless you're nutrient deficient or have failure to thrive or some big deal? Or is it pretty uh, easy to get a referral for a feeding clinic? It's pretty easy to get a referral. We don't typically have a lot of issues with that. Um, I mean, like we have, there are some issues with feeding or with insurance, but that's not as big of a problem as it was in the past. I can remember 20 years ago when, you know, I first started at Hershey, a lot of the insurance companies didn't understand and why, why are you doing this and, and that whole, and so it was a process of educating them, but that's not as big of an issue anymore. Um, yeah. In many cases, children in Pennsylvania is like probably one of the better states for healthcare insurance only because you can have a, a medical assistance backup um, for kids with special needs. So, if um, their primary doesn't pay, then a lot of times the MA backup will take care of it. So that's usually not as big of an issue. It doesn't have to be a so kid you, who's so deficient, they're nutrient deficient. Yeah. And you do also see, because I actually came and did a consult years ago with somebody from out of state who was staying at like the Ronald McDonald house nearby and coming to your clinic. So um, do you have um, a large percentage of your kids that come from out of state or come from internationally even? Well, we've had um, kids from seven countries outside of the U.S. and from 27 states. So we do get kids from a pretty wide range. We don't, um, we try not to take out of state patients, not that we don't try not to, but we try to get them services closer to home. So if right. we got a referral yesterday from Michigan, so we told them what feeding programs are in Michigan, and we told them there's a feeding program in Wisconsin, just because that's easier for them. Now, on Monday, we do have a little boy coming here from South Carolina, but they have family that live near the program. So it's not okay. like that's more convenient for them than actually going to another program where they don't have family. So we're trying to figure out what can we do to best serve the family? And I want to try to keep them, if at all possible, close to home so they don't have to travel yeah. across the country or whatever. And there's far more programs now than there ever were. And there's a website, yeah. Feeding Matters, that has all the lists of the programs, I think internationally, but certainly in the United States. So, um, What's the website? Called Feeding Matters. Feedingmatters.com? I think .org, but... Um, okay, we'll, they, we'll, we'll double check that and put it in the show up. notes. Um, but they, yeah. they certainly, I think, do a good job at at least listing all the programs so that people can get services close to home when possible. Okay. Um, yeah, because we have in my online courses and community, we have people from over 80 countries. And, you know, so it's very international. And, and, um, I tell people if they're looking for a feeding clinic to, to search, um, and maybe, maybe you have additional advice, but to search for, you know, a feeding program, um, their city, state, country, or behavior analysts, which brings me into my next question. So the, some of the clients I brought to you um, were initially because they were in the birth to three program, they were, they were referred to an oral sensory motor type of an approach or a lot of occupational therapists and speech therapists use like, like have a, a different lens on picky eating. And so they, they say, Oh, just expose them to, to playing with food and to um, the sight of food. And in, in my clients with autism with who had severe problems with eating, that just didn't work. So is there a difference between 
um, your, the approach, the behavioral approach, because you're also a BCBAD, right? Mm -hmm. Um, the behavioral approach versus an oral sensory motor approach. Well, I, I, at the end of the day, what needs to happen if you want a child to learn to like new foods is they have to taste that food. In some cases, the goal of the oral motor pro program is like the SOS program is to kind of desensitize the child and have them taste the food. The problem is in some cases, the kid gets stuck. So they'll touch the food or they'll play with the food or they'll maybe sniff the food or lick the food, but they don't ever ingest the food. So it, you never get to the point where you're starting to develop preferences for that food because you never ingest it. And ingestion is required. There's a lot of research that has showed that you can look at a food, but that doesn't make you like the food. Um, and that's, uh, that's one of the problems with the kids that we see. They make their decisions based on the food's appearance. And that's a bad way to make a judgment about food. You should make it based on its taste. Um, and we know that repeated tasting will get kids to like foods, but you actually have to taste it. So if you don't taste it, then that program or intervention, regardless of what theoretical orientation, will probably not be very successful. And I think in more of the- yeah, I, rem I remember one of the, my clients, um, I got there, he just turned to, just diagnosed. They already had an occupational therapist in place and a speech therapist in place. And so now they were adding a behavioral therapist, me. And, you know, I didn't have the feeding goal. That was the occupational therapist goal. My goal was, you know, behavioral uh, therapy, which child wouldn't sit at the table. It took me like three sessions. I was like, what is going on here? Um, and, uh, you know, I'm trying to like figure things out and I don't know what week it was, but all of a sudden I found out that he had extreme picky eating and aversion to mushy foods. And, but that was the occupational therapist goal. And so like, it was almost like a turf war. And I'm like, you know, I can't just come in here and work on my little slice because if he's screaming when, so, so we decided to do a joint session together, me and the OT and mom and, you know, kind of decide like who was going to work and how we were going to work on this. And, and so the child, this particular child who's in my new book, who's in my videos, I have video permission to talk about him and everything. Um, he, uh, the sight of mushy food just freaked him out. So he was good with finger food. He would even eat string beans. He would eat meat. He would eat whatever. You presented mushy foods and he was screaming, right? And so during our joint session, the occupational therapist, you know, I'm like, okay, well, show me how you're going to desensitize him to mushy food. And she brings the applesauce close to him just in the bowl, not even on a spoon. And he screams and she pushes it back. I'm like, well, that's how problem behavior gets shaped up around food. And I was just like, okay, because in my opinion, as a nurse, as a behavior analyst, like talking and feeding are so intertwined that we can't just have these little turf wars or goals. I, I think that's becoming less prevalent now than 20 years ago when I started. I can remember working at Kennedy Krieger and there would be wars between like behavior psychology and, and occupational therapy about what to do and what approach to use and all that kind of stuff. But I think you see it less now than you used to. Um, and I think, well, one of the reasons I think I get referrals from early intervention because what they're doing is either not successful or the kid is vomiting on them or throwing things or whatever. And they're like, Hey, that, that's enough of that. So we'll, we'll come out. <laughs> they, they pass the torch. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, think they, I think people are realizing that, you know, some of the approaches they use may not be effective for that particular person and they may need something else. So, yeah. I, yeah. And, think, and we, and you know, the occupational therapist and I, you know, we, we decided, mom decided, okay, let's try Mary's approach, you know, more behavioral approach for now. And then, you know, it wasn't like, 
you know, I don't want people to think like I'm and I we have an occupational therapist right. interview, Dory Blanche. We have lots of speech therapists. And I'm I, I'm also seeing I mean, I haven't been doing one-to-one work for a number of years, and this was, you know, years ago, but I do think that everybody wants to do what's best for the kid. And so I do think that we see less turf wars. I also think it's because parents are empowered to really see, like, talking and eating and, you know, screaming, and it's all related. Right. I I think that's true. And I, I still think, like yesterday, I saw a young lady for the first time. Um, and she doesn't eat any higher texture foods, but she's been taught to take bites of food and then spit it on the floor, um, which is not very functional. Um, so I talked to mom about that and she said, well, we, the therapist did get her to bite it and then taught her to spit it out. I was like, okay, well, that's a problem. <laughs> We've got to kind of back up and work on this. So, because spitting out your food after you take a bite, you don't get a lot of nutrition from it that way. Um, yeah. So. And then it becomes a problem behavior. And then it's like, well, we can't take them to the restaurant because all they're doing and we can't right. the preschool, you know, unless we give them their preferred snacky foods, it's just a mess. Right. So yeah. That's- yeah. So let's, um, talk about, uh, your, your national autism conference talk where you focused a lot um, this time, and it's two and a half hours. Again, we're going to link it in the show notes at marybarbera.com forward slash 95. You talked a lot about vitamin and mineral deficiencies, which I think is a good segue into, you know, spitting your food out. You're not going to get the vitamins and mineral deficiencies. And you even talked about how you're seeing kind of rare things come back, like scurvy and rickets and things that I hadn't heard since like the 1980s when I was <laughs> studying nursing um, and iron deficiency and that sort of thing. And I know you did two and a half hour talk on it. So um, <laughs> can you just summarize kind of some of the vitamin and mineral deficiencies and what, why you're, you're starting to talk about that more and more? Well, I think... Um... I didn't appreciate how limited some of these children's diets were. Um, And several, we've certainly seen kids with nutrient deficiencies over the years. But I think in some of the cases, we probably, we probably saw more kids with vitamin deficiencies, but we didn't test for it. Um, So we didn't always identify it, I think. Uh, This year, I like have a sticky note on my desk with all the kids I've seen with vitamin C and right with a vitamin C deficiency or scurvy. And right now there's nine kids on that list. And that's from 2020. Um, wow. We are seeing a lot of kids with, um, with vitamin C deficiency. Um, we've seen a kid with pellagra, which is a niacin deficiency, which is almost unheard of in the United States, except in like sometimes you see it in heart nip disease or you see it in... Um, anorexia nervosa or maybe alcoholism, but it's almost unheard of in pediatrics. Um, And we've seen, I just got a referral last week of a child with a a B12 deficiency and a folate deficiency. So um, many of the kids that we see that are deficient are deficient in more than one thing. Um, Almost all the kids that we see with vitamin C deficiency are iron deficient. And we see a lot of kids that are iron deficient. Um, yeah. The young lady. So, what I, kind of what kind of blood work do do you do the blood work, or do you require families well, to get the blood work? Uh, well, and kind of goes both ways. We do get um, at, at this point a lot of kids that are vitamin deficient that are seen in our facility get referred here if their vitamin deficiency is secondary to their diet. Um, in some cases, you'll get vitamin deficiency that's secondary to either a medical condition or a medical treatment. But um, many of the kids that, I mean, certainly all the kids we would see are kids that are just not eating enough to maintain um, nutrition. Um, and in some cases, they've already had it. Or when they call me to refer, I'll ask, well, did you get a vitamin C? Or have you already checked the ferritin levels? Or, um, you know, this is a possible issue? Can you get that blood work? So they'll already get it. Or when we get a referral from a PCP and they're kind of telling me some of these things, I'll ask them to get the blood work before I see them. When possible, we'd like to know before because then it's going to help us with treatment on 
uh, what kind of things do we need to address? Um, so yeah, it's possible yeah. we get it before. Are these, are these just traditional blood tests that you're ordering? For the most part, yeah. I mean, it's, it's vitamin C is actually hard to get because it's a frozen sample. So it's a pain in the butt to get that. And sometimes it, some labs won't do it. You got to go to a, uh, like a hospital-based lab or a clinic-based lab and not just like a, a lab you're going to have in, the, out in a mall or something. Um, so some yeah. of them are a little more complicated. And some of the stuff, like if you're drawing the blood work that you need to see if the child has appropriate niacin, that's not even a common test. And they don't even have, um, they don't even have really standards for it for pediatrics. So you typically have to get that done in a hospital setting. Um, so, but by and large, I mean, one of the biggest things we see is kids with iron deficiency. So, and that's pretty common blood work. I mean, they'll, they'll check your hemoglobin and stuff. And a lot of times in the office or at WIC or somewhere. So, um, those things are not hard to get. So we're not doing a lot of blood work that only we do in the world, but, um, we do do some blood work that has to be done here or another hospital and not at many outpatient clinics. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's confusing because I know 20 years ago, you know, with Lucas, I mean, nobody was asking for blood work. They were just saying his weight doesn't, you know, even, even coming to your clinic with my clients, like there was, there was a, a in my opinion, like a real lack of, of, you know, looking at that. But so I was, I was surprised and, and interested in, in these vitamin and mineral deficiencies that you're seeing. I did a podcast interview episode number 80 with Denise Voigt, who's a nutritional functional medicine nutritionist. And, and she's very up on all this stuff. So you may want to listen to that lecture as well. But um, so, so all of these uh, vitamin and mineral uh, tests, blood tests can be done at a hospital setting and sure. Um, um, and yeah. some of it, I mean, we don't send every kid for every test. We, we screen to see which ones, like what could be a possible problem. If a child is taking multivitamins or they're drinking four cans of Pediasure a day, I'm not worried about some of the vitamins because I know they're getting their nutrition from that. But if, I mean, the little girl I saw yesterday, in the past, she was eating two pounds of yogurt at a serving. Um, and not eating very much else, which is what led to iron deficiency in her case. So we can kind of know from the diet, like, oh my gosh, we got to look to see if this child's got a, he doesn't have a vitamin C source. So we probably need to find out if this kid has scurvy um, mm. or they're starting to exhibit symptoms. Like we just published an article this year where the very first sign you have of scurvy is not the, like in scurvy, you get um, your your gums will bleed and, and you'll start getting little pink, little purple dots all over your body. But the very first sign is looks like it's leg pain. So if you've mm -hmm. got kids with unidentified leg pain and it didn't twist their ankle or there's not a scrape or a bruise or something like that, one of the things you sh might want to think about is identifying what's in their diet. Um, mm -hmm. And I know the folks and, in dermatology are doing that now. Yeah. Wow. Um, um, so scurvy is what deficiency? Vitamin C. And then rickets are? Rickets if you're not getting vitamin D. Um, okay. And we see a couple of those because then your bones get softened. And you have kids that, like, they still call it this. They call it either bow-legged or knock-kneed. So your legs will turn out or they'll turn in. Um, now that we don't see that as much because that kind of gets caught pretty early. And there really is, pediatrics have a, a huge awareness of vitamin D deficiency now. So they look for that all the time. They give kids supplemental vitamin D, especially like now when you can't go outside as much and you know we, we're losing sunshine because it's turning to winter. Um, so I think that's, you're gonna see less of that I think because it, there's an awareness of it. Yeah, so sometimes multivitamins though, um, like for instance, when Lucas was little, I was giving him multivitamins and he would get agitated like 20 to 30 minutes after I gave it to him. And then like one day I forgot to give him his multivitamins, so I gave it to him late. And then 30 minutes later he got agitated. And it turns out that the multivitamin had copper in it. I know way back uh, somebody at Hershey did some research 
that I found out about years ago on the zinc to copper ratio. Is that something you guys look at? And it, and also zinc, is that important for feeding issues? It is. And if you're zinc deficient, it decreases your appetite. And if you are zinc deficient and you get zinc, often your appetite will increase. If you're not zinc deficient and you get extra zinc, it, I don't think it has any effect, but um, and we do pretty rare. We do see, we have had a kid with a zinc deficiency because they get rashes and they're referred to dermatology, but um, that's, that's less typical because um, zinc is added to food. So it's a, in, in a number of foods that kids would typically eat. Um, we don't look at the zinc to copper ratio as much. I know that was something that Dr. Raymer did research on. Right. That's the, the name. Um, and it certainly, it could be that kids are going to get multivitamins and there may be something in there that they don't tolerate. It may be even an additive or something that's, um, part of the vitamin that's really not the vitamin. And in which case they may have to take, look at more, what are they deficient in instead of taking a multivitamin, just take vitamin C. Um, supplement or look at trying to all ideally we don't want them to take a vitamin but we'd rather have every kid eat a healthy diet that consists of enough foods that are going to have that but we know that that's not like what are you going to do over the shorter term until you get everybody to eat fruits and vegetables can you do something that's going to at least keep them from not being deficient so we do try to do that and recommend mm -hmm. vitamins and, and then how can we get the child to take them that doesn't want to take it and, we go over mechanisms for yeah. that. So, well, I know they on the multivitamins that Lucas still takes to this day. They have copper free. So I do think that um, mm -hmm. avoiding copper for kids with autism is is kind of and you know they they that it, it does affect the zinc to copper ratio if you get added copper and you can't tolerate it for whatever reason. Yeah. So. Um, this kind of segues in. I know I had a lot of problems in the beginning with Lucas, like taking supplements, like for a picky eater, and and it also kind of ties in in your in your national autism conference talk. You talked a lot about cereal, um, about juice, and about milk. And so, um, do you like? I don't like to sneak supplement stuff into little kids juice and stuff like that. But I guess sometimes you have to like, what do you recommend for parents who have picky eaters who need supplementation and how to get it in them? The, the only rule is that there are no rules. Um, <laughs> is it like you, you often hear like, and the general rule when pediatricians talk to parents is okay, your child should be drinking milk and they should be drinking water and don't give many juice because it's just a bunch of added sugar. And I think well, that, and that I used to give that advice until I heard your knack talk. I'm like, I have to ask Dr. Williams about this because I'm I'm clearly giving the wrong advice. Well, I think that if you look at it, like when pediatricians sometimes give that advice, they're looking for these general rules to give the or general guidelines to give to everybody. But you got to realize that not everybody fits in a guideline. Um, and some of the kids that we see eat no fruits and they eat no vegetables and they take no multivitamins. So they have no source of vitamin C unless they're drinking juice. And you do get vitamin C is added to most juices. And in fact, companies have kind of figured out that that's a selling point by adding vitamins to things and they do put it in juice. So even though if you eat an apple, there's not very much vitamin C in an apple, but they add vitamin C to apple juice. And those nasty apples, well, they're not nasty, but the apples you get at McDonald's that never turn brown, they never turn brown because they've got vitamin C added to them. So that's a good thing for some of the kids that we see, eat the apples that never turn brown because they put scorbic acid in there, which is vitamin C. So I don't tell parents, don't ever give your kid juice unless, you know, if their kid's eating a whole bunch of fruits and they eat vegetables and stuff, and I know they've got adequate vitamin C, then I'd say, well, your kid probably doesn't need juice and, unless it helps them poop. Um, but otherwise, um, you know, you got to look at things a little bit differently. And in some cases, we do crush a multivitamin, and then we systematically fade it into the juice because that's what the kid takes. And I, I've got a chance of getting them to do that. But if you just gave them a Flintstones, they are not going to do that or they might not chew a gummy. 
Um, so it kind of depends on what I need. Uh, and in some cases, we'll get liquid vitamins and systematically add it to things. So we use shaping and fading all the time to try to get these kids to take their, their vitamins, just like we would getting them to take their food. Um, so we have to, you know, we've tried to be as creative as we can trying to figure out how can we get vitamins to these kids to alleviate their nutrient deficiencies. Because we know that, you know, if we don't, we don't get them to take some kind of iron source, we're going to fix that here. We're going to, the hematologist is going to give them an infusion. But the problem will be, oh, the infusion is going to work and it's going to work great and it'll be way more effective, but it'll only work while you're getting infusion. So at some point, if you stop taking the infusions, but you haven't changed your diet and you're not taking any kind of supplementation, you're going to become deficient again. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what about uh, weaning from bottles and then your child refuses milk? I mean, it's, these are just common, common things that and, happen. And that and, Well, and that is one of the, we well, have typically two issues. One is the child is drinking tons of formula out of a bottle. And then the pediatrician said, okay, your child is old enough. Now switch over to milk. But the child's not taking an adequate number of foods. So they're not getting the nutrition that they got in the formula from the milk. So very quickly, and, and they get deficient. In, and it's almost always an iron. Because um, if you look at kids that are iron deficient, it's almost always toddlers. And it's because they've switched off the formula and went on to cow's milk and there's no, and they're drinking too much cow's milk and not eating enough food. So what's the, what does iron deficiency cause? Well, like my, people might say, well, what's the big deal? What, 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 what's the downside of being well, iron deficient? Well, it, it affects cognition is the kind of the big one. Um, so um, it will impair your ability to, you know, it'll impair cognitive abilities or impair learning. So that's, that's the huge drawback. So if you've got a child that already has special needs, um, they certainly don't have the, any other challenges. So if you get rid of the, the iron deficiency, it can improve the, their ability to learn. But you also mm -hmm. see some other stuff as well. I mean, um, a lot of times you hear about kids with restless legs or periodic limb disorder movement um, and to kick a lot at night or kicking their blankets off. One of the, the things that that's caused by is iron deficiency. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the, the things that we, we actually ask that all the time now, uh, probably more than we ever have is just, you know, not just about sleep problems, but do the blankets all end up on the floor in the morning? And do you see your kid thrashing about at night? So they have um, this and then we'll look at their diet to see if they might be iron deficient. Um, yeah. But iron deficiency, yeah. I mean, you can get leg pain from it. You can get Depends on how far along, but certainly the big reason not to have it is it impacts your learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When Lucas, when I wanted him to take supplements and multivitamins and stuff, initially I had like a crusher thing and I'd, mm -hmm. um, I put it in um, applesauce and, and fed it to right. him, um, which worked out okay. Um, and then Eventually, um, we started dunking his pills, very small pills to begin with, and then um, capsules. So he now um, still takes all his medicine, capsules, whatever, in he, he dunks it in applesauce and takes it. Um, and we never taught him. I mean, if a gun was to my head, I could teach him to swallow with water but it's like his routine and it's not you know well, don't I mean, if it's effective stuff. i wouldn't change it yeah it, it works and a lot of people do that a lot of adults do that kind of stuff they'll use something pudding or or whatever to, to swallow their pills and that's absolutely fine and i tell parents yeah. when we're working on vitamins or supplements or something that the child needs i was like i don't look at this as necessarily something that they'll always need but it's something we got to do right now because they're deficient or they're at risk of deficiency. And we would mm -hmm. just want to fix that first. And I think it would be quicker to get, to get your child to do one thing than get your child to eat a bunch, you know, a sufficient amount of fruits and vegetables where the vitamins are there, but maybe they're not as concentrated. So you have to eat more of them. 
Yeah. So you guys um, at Hershey, you did some groundbreaking work years ago. I was in a study with a thousand um, other families and your results and um, subsequent research has shown that kids with autism, even though their families eat fruits and vegetables, the kids with autism do not. And so you, you've said that that's, that's very much proven at this point, right? Yeah, we weren't the only, I mean, we did a study years ago where we looked at a community samples of kids with autism and kids without autism and the children with autism, and these aren't kids that are referred to feeding programs, they're just kids in schools. Um, the children with autism ate about a third fewer vegetables, or no, a half fewer vegetables, a half fewer fruits, a half fewer meats, about a third fewer starches, and I think it was a half as many dairy products. So like every category, they ate fewer food. So they were more selective. And this is just, um, you know, a, a community sample. And if you look at like the history of autism, in Leo Kanner's first work that he described at Johns Hopkins, almost all those kids that are in this initial sample that became autism, they're almost all food selective. Food selectivity or feeding issues of some sort that should have always been in description of, of kids that are on the spectrum. It's pervasive. And tons of other studies have found the same things we were. We didn't find anything unique. Um, other people have found that kids with autism have feeding issues more commonly than kids with autism, without autism. So um, I think it's, it's pretty much settled now that, that kids with autism very, are, um, have a high probability of having feeding issues. And it's actually, if you look at younger kids, like Sue Mays did a study, it's been about a year ago now. She found that one of the things you see is that's one of the diagnostic markers for autism. So is, is feeding issues. So if you're looking at little kids that may have ADHD or autism or, or intellectual disabilities, one of the things that stands out, the kids that, that get identified with autism they're more likely to have feeding problems. So Wow. Wow. And my book that's coming out in 2021, we actually have a published date of 3.30, March 30th, um, 2021, um, is all for little kids, one to five-year-olds with signs of autism, maybe with a diagnosis, maybe without, because these kids are all facing similar struggles. And we don't know if it's going to turn out to be autism or ADHD or learning disability or nothing, or just a speech delay or, or just uh, they're going to be fine. But I do think that parents um, are really, really struggle with, with feeding. And, you know, there's a lot of, like, when Lucas was struggling with feeding, I was a nurse, but I wasn't a behavior analyst. And there's a whole lot that you could be doing like that's, you're, you're just trying your best. Like I was with my, my client who with the applesauce coming back and forth for like a month before I realized that he had major issues with feeding because the parents were not reporting it. They were like walking on eggshells in terms of food. They, they're just like, give him the finger foods for the rest of his life. Like, I don't want to have him cry, which I'm not a big fan of crying. Like I want the kid not to cry either, but the sooner you can address feeding issues, the better. I totally agree. And if you look at it from a developmental perspective, the people that are best at learning new tastes or developing new taste preferences are infants. If you, infants will develop a preference for a novel food within zero to five tastes or one to five tastes, they'll almost immediately, they'll pick up a preference for a food. And across the course of development, that actually takes more and more tastes. Adults are horrible at it. To learn to like a new food, adults have to often taste that particular food up to 40 times. So it's, wow. if you work on it younger, it's easier. Now it's not mm -hmm. easier from the fact that, you know, little kids, don't talk so they communicate by yelling at you or throwing things at you um, so it's harder in that regard you don't have you know language that you can use to mediate some things but um, certainly it's easier if you work on some of these things before they build up all these habits and these patterns of eating that are so well established that they've done thousands and thousands of times so you're right younger is better Maybe not easier, yeah. but better. Yeah. 
Um, utensil use is another thing that we get asked about a lot. And I know in the early intervention world, when I was in there, um, a lot of times the goal is for kids to feed themselves. And then when you have a, an extremely picky eater that suddenly, you know, goes to not tra- taking a bottle or, or whatever, and then you've got the pressure to eat with utensils, it can become very aversive. And it also can become like, I'm going to do it myself and I'm going to eat what I want. And so what, what advice do you have, especially for really young kids, like under four about utensil use? Well, I, I think you got to look at what your goals are. Um, Cause uh, one of the parents had been, the child was taught to use utensils, but they don't eat anything. So they feed themselves everything, but they only feed themselves like six things. And the, the parent said, well, I was told that we don't want to take away any autonomy. I was like, well, okay, um, but what's going to be the easiest way to get your child to taste these different foods? And they can feed it themselves and we can set up reinforce or whatever, but you got to realize that having them do that adds another, it makes the response effort higher. So now they not only have to eat this thing they don't want to eat, but they have to feed it to themselves. So it makes it more difficult. Or if you're trying to teach a child to chew, and they only feed themselves, it's gonna be harder to actually hold it on their molars and reinforce them from biting down and, and starting to teach all these skills that turn into chewing. So you don't, we're not trying to take away their autonomy. We're trying to figure out how to teach them a skill that's the most efficient way. Um, so I don't, I'm not against self-feeding and I'm not against doing that, but that's not the only goal. The goal is to get them to eat a wide variety of things. And typically I tell parents, if we can get them to eat a wide variety of foods and get them not to refuse, self-feeding often comes in anyway. You don't even have to teach it. If they want the food, they'll often be a lot more willing to feed themselves that food. But if they don't want the food and you're start trying to teach them to feed themselves that food, that's always not that easy. Now, and this is typically with much younger kids. Now, if a kid's 15, of course, we're not gonna necessarily go step back and then feed them that food. Um, they're going to do that themselves, but um, that's kind of, they've got a different history at that point. Yeah. One of the biggest things I see too, um, that I learned way back when Lucas was in his feeding program 20 years ago is, is um, we have to really get kids to stop grazing all day. We have to stop um, making them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich after the family meal, because you know, you're worried that they're not eating anything and you have to stop if they are taking a bottle or drinking milk and juice, it can't be all day long where they're filling up because then they're not really going to want food. So I do think that that's, and maybe, maybe you have a different bigger thing, but I think that would be like my number one tip is like stop the grazing and, and get the children hungry. I I think you're absolutely right. And if you look at selective eaters that come into our clinic, most are over the 50th percentile. So they're not, most of the kids that we see for selective eating are not failure to thrive. In fact, almost none of them are. Uh, Most of them are over the 50th percentile. It is not uncommon for us to see kids that are over the 85th percentile and some that are over the 99th percentile. And the parents are still worried that they're not getting enough to eat because they confuse volume with variety. So they give their kids, well, they didn't eat anything, so I got to give them something. So I gave them 12 chicken nuggets for dinner. Um, And the kids like two. So I was like, uh, you know, they're getting huge amounts of calories from the things that they do eat, but they only eat three things. So um, I think that you're right. And we do see kids that, and parents very often discount drinking as a form of, like, they don't consider that eating. So the it's not uncommon for us to see kids that drink 100 ounces of milk a day. And the parents are worried about them getting enough to eat. Well, your kid took 100 ounces of milk. They're not going to want to eat anything because they're full. Or they'll drink a lot of juice. I mean, you know, like a quart a day or two quarts a day of juice um, and then not eat at meals. Well, that's because they're drinking juice all day, which is full of calories. It's not, um, not water. So we'd see that kind of stuff all the time. And the, the snack food that they do graze in, 
snack foods don't tend to be low in calories. Um, there's not much calories in one individual goldfish, but kids don't typically eat one individual goldfish. They eat a bag full. So yeah. you're correct. And so my, my advice usually within my online courses is, is, you know, meals and snacks at the kitchen table or at the teaching table, if you want to use edibles, you know, but really monitor quantities and then only water outside of meals and that sort of thing. Although with the vitamin C deficiency and that sort of thing, we might, you know, start saying, well, juice is okay, but I still think they need to be seated. They need to be drinking and not just carrying our sippy cup around all day long. Yes. No, we, I totally agree. And in some cases, parents won't do that. Like they won't feed, won't not give them food. So we do have to look at, in that particular case, like what kind of things can we recommend? And I'll tell parents, okay, well, if you've got to have, give him something, can he have some kind of fruit? So at least, you know, if you know your kid's eating fruit, then one, fruit is more nutrient rich than a lot of things. And fruit tends to be low in caloric density. So I don't see a lot of kids who like, oh my gosh, he ate so many apples, he's not going to eat any dinner. That usually doesn't work that way. But I have seen it, well, if they eat so many cookies, they're not going to eat their dinner. So we will make some adjustments to that. We do try to get them on a meal and snack schedule. Um, and then hopefully that, because they don't have a hunger satiety cycle if you're just eating snacks all day. Yeah. What about a smoothie? What about like milkshake smoothie where you can uh, blend things in? What's your take we, on that? Yep. We're fine with that. And, and if that's a way to get in vitamins and minerals, I'm not against that. Do I want that to be their sole source of nutrition? No. But I know that if we can, in some of these cases, we're trying to figure out what can we do today to address the issue? And then what are we going to address over the long term? Um, and they're not necessarily the same thing. So and we will use smoothies and we'll put vitamins in there. We'll put spinach leaves in there to get iron or, or whatever. But, um, and, and one family yesterday put egg in their smoothie, uh, which I hadn't heard of. But raw, it, a raw it's, egg? It's cooked. Oh, it's cooked. No. oh cooked. I was yeah. like, uh, raw egg, that probably wouldn't no, be good. No, I asked that. Um, but it, <laughs> and it is a good way to get vitamins and minerals in there, protein. Um, but the whole goal will, will eventually be to get the child to eat the scrambled egg, not have it in a smoothie. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but I know that there's books yeah. out there written about like how to hide spinach in broccoli or, or hide spinach in brownies. Um, and okay. I'm, I'm okay with that as a, you know, but the goal at the end of the day, will get the kid to eat vegetables and eat fruits and not have it always in the form of a, um, a treated baked good. So. Right. Right. And it's a lot of work for parents to be yes. maneuvering and, and a picky eater, if you hide something and he tastes it and stuff that could backfire right. too. Absolutely. And so like the sneakiness, that's why I like to, you know, when I recommend like how to give supplements or medication, I mean, that's a whole nother issue is like, if you have, you know, seizure meds or something that you have to give, like it needs to be on time. It can't be walking around all day with a, right. with a juice cup hidden in there. You don't even know if they're getting it. So like, I like to sit them down, do applesauce or pudding or ice cream or whipped cream and uh, be like, you're getting your meds now. And it's, it's going to not taste horrible because I'm mixing it, but like not to sneak it in because I think sneaking may be a very short term thing, but in the end, well, like, right. like you said, um, it's, it's kind of has to be like the child has to accept it and, and has to take it on time and the full amount. And you need right. to know that you got it in. I, I totally agree. And I think that it, um, you do, I don't see many kids who are on like seizure meds or cardiac meds or whatever, because I think the parents see that well, that's a medication. They have to have that or else some, that we're going to get this bad health effect. I think it's harder to, to, see food that way even though it should be seen that way because if you don't mm -hmm. eat iron you're going to have a problem if you don't take in vitamin c there's going to be a problem but i don't think they see it the same way and i try mm -hmm. to tell parents that really when they say essential vitamins what they mean by essentially is your body can't function without them so we have to have them in there so 
you have to have vitamins just like you have to have a, a seizure medication or a cardiac medication or chemotherapy. You have to have these things. Um, yeah. But it yeah. is. Well, I, I, yeah, I think um, just our whole talk, I think we're going to wrap it up, but I think the whole talk, it does really make you aware. Hopefully it makes our listeners aware of that, that food and nutrients are like any other uh, medication and are, you know, it doesn't have to be an abrupt, we're going to fix everything overnight. But I definitely think, you know, listeners can get your broccoli boot camp, um, especially the professionals can try to seek this treating eating problem book. And hopefully um, you will get that revision done because I think there's going to be a lot of demand uh, for the treating eating problem uh, book. Once my once my book comes out, because there's a whole feeding chapter, and I do reference you and your work, which I think has been incredible over the years. So thank you so much for coming today. Um, before we wrap up, how can people um, follow you, follow your work? I know you're you're an academic, you're in uh, Hershey Medical Center, um, and you are still teaching at Penn State University Harrisburg campus. Wow. And so like, can people follow your work or just get your books? Well, they can, um, we do have a page on, uh, there's a page on Google Scholar that has all the publications there. I'm on ResearchGate that has all the publications there so they can see that. Uh, there's actually a broccoli, broccolibootcamp.com website and Laura is good about putting our talks up there. So um, I'm not good about it, but she is very good about putting up her talks and, and my talks there so you can follow the stuff there. And certainly you can always get a hold of me um, here at the Med Center. Um, I'll, I'll get you the email address that you can put up there so that if somebody has a question or whatever, they can just call me and, or email me and ask me. Wow. So. Well, that is all very generous of you. Um, I really appreciate your time today. And one last question, part of my podcast goals are for parents and professionals to be less stressed and lead happier lives. So I'm wondering if you have any stress reduction tips that you give parents or professionals or students um, that, or you use yourself. Well, I I will, yeah, I will tell you, um, a lot of the parents that I work with are concerned about this eating and they're stressed about some of these things. And I got to try to tell them that you don't look at any of these things over a single day. We're not going to fix this feeding problem this afternoon. We're going to start a little bit on it today and a little bit on it tomorrow and a little bit the next day and keep working on it over time. And if you can just do that and try to, you're going to have a bad meal. And what should you say? Well, maybe the next meal will be better. And if you can do that, then I think we're going to be okay over the course of time. But um, you got to really ask what are the issues that you have to worry about today and which ones can you work for work on over the long term? Um, and if you know that, that should make it a little bit easier. But I know this is, this is a tough time for everybody with this pandemic and it's been stressful for a lot of the families I work with because they're a lot of them are working at home with their kids and they're working at home for their job. So they get no escape from anything. Um, so I try to tell, let's just work on some things today that are manageable and we'll work on other stuff tomorrow. Baby steps, baby steps. Baby steps, steps. Right. there you go. All right. Well, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you today and uh, look forward to following your work in years to come. So thank you. I'll see you, Mary. Bye now.